everyone. Welcome to Keto and Crime. Today we have the case of Leopold and Loeb. Uh, this was uh, the real life uh, kidnapping and murder that inspired Alfred Hitchcock's Rope. And I believe also a stage play as well in which Rope was based on. But this is uh, the second kind of duo in our uh, real crime and the movies um, October. So this is the crime and then my next video will be a review of Alfred Hitchcock's Rope. So with that being said, I uh, also want to say I know my uh, trusty uh, hoodie has been making a lot of appearance because it's cold. Um, usually here in Tennessee we don't see cold weather uh, in fall until sometimes almost Christmas. So we've had 75 degree Christmas days here. So, um, but for some reason now we are in, uh, you know, we have lows in the 40s, 30s and 40s at night and highs of in the high 60s. Well, my office is near the uh, entranceway of the house and because we have two other people that work from home, so we have to separate ourselves. And um, it's cold. It's uh, like 50 degrees here where I am in the house because I'm near the entranceway and there's the draft. So um, the hoodie will be making uh, lots of appearances this October unless I can find somewhere else to film. So with that being said, yes, I am washing my clothes. <laughs> with that being said, let's jump into Leopold and Lowe. Nathan Leopold was born November 19th, 1904 in Chicago, Illinois. He was the son of Florence and Nathan Leopold, a wealthy German Jewish family. He was considered a child prodigy. Uh, he is said to have spoken his first words at the age of four months. I kind of reminds me of that scene on uh, Friends where um, Ross and Rachel are, you know, their baby Emma, and she's saying Gleba, which technically is a word in the dictionary. They actually looked it up. But it's kind of that, did, did he really? Did he really? They say he did. Anyway, um, he was very, very talented, um, excelled in high school, and eventually went on to the University of Chicago, where he was a member of the Phi Beta Kappa Honor Fraternity, and uh, had also planned to begin Harvard University uh, to study law. Uh, reportedly, he had studied 15 languages and could speak five of them fluently. I'm beginning to see a pattern with this guy. And uh, supposedly he was a world-renowned world orthologist, which is uh, basically uh, a bird watcher. Uh, somebody that knows a lot about birds. So, you know, Birdman of Alcatraz was a thing. So it's possible. Uh, he basically uh, was one of the first ornithologists to identify the Kirtland's warbler and made uh, a lot of observations about parasites that affect birds. Even after his crime, which we will talk about, he continued to write about birds and wrote to a field, several field museum magazines from his prison sales, at, from his prison sale and remained kind of a thing in the bird watching community. So there's that. Now let's move on to his partner in life and partner in crime, Richard, Richard Loeb. Richard Loeb was born June 11th, 1905 in Chicago. His mother was Anna, Hen Anna Henrietta Loeb and Albert Henry Loeb. Um, one was a wealthy lawyer and, a, and the other was a retired uh, vice president of Sears Roebuck and Company. Um, so very prominent families in both of these instances. Uh, his father was Jewish and his mother was Catholic, which meant that he was very much self-loathing. I'm sure, having had both of those intermingled, I'm sure his mother guilted him and he guilted himself. So very, very self-loathing. Uh, like his future partner, uh, Leopold Loeb, was very intelligent. Um, he skipped several grades in school and became the University of Michigan's youngest graduate at the age of 17. So here we have a bona fide genius. I mean, that is legitimately proven that he did 
graduate college at the age of 17. He enrolled in law, at law, in law school at the University of Chicago and was wanting to do graduate work in history at the time of the murder. Now, he was kind of a loner. Um, unlike uh, Leopold, who was very outgoing in fraternities, um, wrote for magazines, bird watching, he preferred to uh, play tennis and read detective novels, uh, listen to the radio, things like that. So a little bit more of a loner and a little bit more of a recluse. Now, the two of them grew up in the same neighborhood, the area of Kenwood in Chicago, on Chicago's south side, which is technically now more of a higher crime, lower, you know, working class, lower income area. But then it wasn't. It was actually really, really nice. Um, in fact, the Loeb's owned a summer estate uh, in uh, Michigan and uh, a mansion in uh, Kenwood as well. And the boys spent some time together as the families would socialize together growing up. Though they kind of knew each other, they weren't really the best of friends. As I said, Loeb was more of a loner. Leopold was more of a social butterfly. When they both ended up at the University of Chicago, um, Loeb as a law student and Leopold as an undergraduate, they became fast friends and eventually lovers. They were a gay couple. And uh, they discovered uh, a mutual interest in crime. And I can imagine going to college, meeting someone that I was attracted to and them also have an interest in crime, but then turn out that they actually wanted to commit a crime. So it would never, <laughs> I, I can understand how this was kind of a perfect storm. Usually in these kinds of couples, there's one that kind of puts the seed in the other one's head and then it kind of spirals out. They're usually not both equally evil. There's usually one that's a little more evil. And I'm I'm just speculating as that there's really no proof of any of that. Leopold, now, Leopold and Loeb, particularly Leopold, were absolutely fascinated with the ideas put forth by a German writer Nietzsche, which basically put forth this whole thing of a Superman. You know, Nietzsche originally said God is dead, and he followed that up by saying that there are certain ones amongst us that rise above an average human being. They have superior intellect, superior morality, superior sense of everything, and the rules don't apply to them. And that's kind of where they were going off. They really believed because of their intellect, at least Leopold did, that he was above law. He was above morality and that he could also probably have the intellect to not only commit a murder, but get away with it. And so that is kind of what leads them down this path. So... He really got behind this, and that's how this whole thing about can we get away with crime, I'm so smart, I can get away with crime kind of thing. Now, the first thing you have to realize is that no human being possesses capabilities more, more than other human beings. We all have the same, you know, there are people with slightly higher IQs, but it also comes down to how you apply that intelligence. So... Technically speaking, if you all start from ground zero, you have no other super capabilities than anyone else. It's all how you apply it. So, of course, we know this was Munk, but he was really into the whole fact, and this goes back to me saying there's usually one that's a little more evil than the other. He got Loeb into this concept and decided that doing crime, since they were both interested in true crime, that doing crime and getting away with it would be the only way they could prove they were of this Superman variety and not the Christopher Reeves kind. They also engaged in a little game on, because many of the crimes they started out with in the mid-20s were petty, breaking into fraternity houses, uh, petty crimes. But there was also a game that uh, basically if Nathan accompanied Richard, while crimes were done, then he would agree to have sex with him. So it was kind of a, a sexual thing for them. And you will see this when we go over Alfred Hitchcock's rope, how sexuality is kind of interwoven into the crime. But they basically began to uh, do petty theft, vandalism, and then they kind of uh, got upset because no one was paying any attention to them. They were the original, you know, get famous for crime 
type of couple. Uh, there was no media coverage. The local Chicago press did not cover their petty little crimes at the University of Chicago and in the surrounding areas, and they were disappointed, so they decided they had to up the ante to get their fame and prove they could get away with it, which kind of seems contradictory. You want to get away with it, which means we don't know your name, or you want to get caught, get acquitted so that you're a celebrity. Now, which is it? You know, criminal minds and evil de demented minds all the way around. And that question was later answered by a series of letters where the kidnapping and murder that they agreed would be their super crime. They would not only do it, they would get caught and then they would get notoriety from it and get away with it, that is, be acquitted. So it wasn't just about doing crimes and proving we could get away with it without anybody knowing it. It was, we're going to get the fame and the popularity from it and then get acquitted. So they had to find a suitable person to kidnap and kill. And they settled on young Bobby Franks. He's a 14-year-old son of a wealthy Chicago manufacturer, watch manufacturer. Um, he was also distantly related to Loeb as a second cousin and had off, had played tennis with Loeb uh, several times. you got to remember, Lo Leopold and Loeb were only 19 and 18. They weren't, you know, in their 20s. They weren't even what you would consider fully grown men at the time. They were boys. And so they decided to kidnap Bobby Franks and kill him. And they put this into motion on the afternoon of May 21st, 1924. They drove up on Franks as he was walking home from uh, the Harvard Boys School uh, in the Kenwood area, a very fancy prep school that one, of the, that one of our perpetrators had also attended, and offered him a ride. He initially said no because his home was only two blocks away. There was no need to ride. And eventually, because he had played tennis with them, uh, they said they wanted to discuss their new, the new racket they had gotten. So that, you know, interested uh, Bobby, so he did get into the car. Now, prior to the crime, they had come up with what they thought was the perfect weapon. And in the movie, you're going to see them talking about a rope, hence the name rope being the perfect weapon. But in real life, it was a chisel or an ice, yeah, an ice chisel, not an ice pick, but a chisel that you would use to do an ice sculpture. Uh, at this time, you would more often see them, you know, because people still had ice boxes at the time. You would use them to break off the blocks of ice to actually put them in the ice boxes. So it was a chisel. So it was literally a metal thing with a point on it. You would use a hammer to shape and form ice. And so they decided that that would be the perfect weapon. And they uh, had Loeb sit, since Loeb had played tennis with uh, Bobby in the past, he sat in the back seat with Bobby discussing a tennis racket while Leopold drove the car. And in the midst of their conversation about the tennis racket, Loeb struck Franks several times with the chisel on the head, knocking him out, and then puncturing his head, gagging him where he eventually bled to death. Uh, they were also in a rented car. Uh, Leopold had rented the car under a the name Morton D. Ballard, so they weren't even using their car. Uh, they pulled the body down into the floorboard, and they drove to their predetermined dumping spot again. They had the perfect dumping spot, Wolf Lake, in Hammond, Indiana, about 25 miles south of Chicago. So you're talking about leaving the state with this body, getting it way out of sight. Uh, so after nightfall, they removed uh, and discarded Frank's clothes, or Bobby's clothes, and then concealed the body in a culvert along the Pennsylvania Railroad tracks nor north of that very lake. To obscure the body's identity, they poured hydrochloric acid on the face and genita genitals to disguise the fact he had been circumcised because, again, a Jewish boy. Uh, by the time the two men returned to Chicago, uh, Franks had already been reported missing by his parents. So he had been missing since roughly three in the afternoon. And um, Leopold at the time actually called Frank's mother, identifying himself as George Johnson, and told her that her son had been kidnapped and that instructions for delivering the ransom would follow. They then mailed a typed version of a ransom note, which I will put, put here. And then they burned both Frank's and their bloody clothing.
They then took the car back to near their apartment, near the University of Chicago. They cleaned the upholstery, washed the car, and then they spent the remainder of that evening playing cards. Uh, once the uh, Bobby's family, the Franks, received the ransom note, um, Leopold again called, saying again he was Mr. Johnson, and dictated the first set of instructions for the ransom payment. Uh, basically, uh, wanting to set all of this in motion and make it a really big media deal. This was a rich, affluent family with a kidnapped son, and now you have a ransom demand. Now, the ransom plan kind of alluded to the fact that there would be clues. So they were playing a very high-strung game with the, with the Frank family. They would call them and tell them, go to this store to get a, a clue for your next clue. And so it was kind of this intricate system. But however, things kind of went awry when uh, a member of the Frank family got a little nervous and forgot what store they were supposed to be going to to get this next clue, and simultaneously, Bobby Frank's body was found. Once he was found, they knew that their jig to get ransom money out of the family was up, and they ended up destroying the typewriter. They burned a blanket that they had used in the car to use the uh, move the body. They'd already disposed of everyone's clothes, and they went about their lives as usual. In the weeks following uh, the finding of the boy's body, um, Loeb went about his normal life. He didn't talk to anybody, didn't mention it, but Leopold was making as much fuss as possible. He talked to anybody that would listen. Anytime the case came up, he would talk about theories of how they did it, why it was done, who did it. So like, again, true crime. He was very much into spouting his opinions. He even told um, one person that if I were to murder anybody, it would be a cocky little SOB such as Bobby Franks, a 14-year-old boy. All 14-year-old boys are cocky. Get over it, dude. Uh, they did find a pair of, air, uh, they had found a pair of eyeglasses near Frank's body, and although it was, you know, relatively common thing for people to have eyeglasses. Um, it was fitted with a hinge that kept the eyeglasses from sliding up and down the nose. Uh, and according to the uh, optician that had, that had designed it and had put it on there, that there were only three people in the entire city of Chicago that had this, and one of them was Leopold. And in typical Leopold fashion, he did not even need glasses. Uh, Several months before the crime was committed, he had been complaining of headaches and all of his writing and studying and bird watching. And he went to a uh, an uh, optometrist or oculist, as they were called at the time, on uh, North Michigan Avenue in Chicago and got reading glasses that once his headaches cleared up after just a few weeks, he stopped wearing them and had actually forgotten they were in his pocket. But he did kind of keep them around to give the appearance of more intelligence, and then he had forgotten they were in his pocket, and he lost them. However, to cover himself when he was questioned by police, Leopold told them that he had been on a bird-watching excursion and had lost his glasses. Um, that the two men, to give an alibi, because now they're both being questioned, Leopold has pulled Loeb right into this, that they had... Uh, gone out and picked up two women and taken them to play tennis on the night that the murder happened and uh, had then dropped them off without ever learning their first. Leopold's chauffeur said that that was a lie after they questioned everybody associated with Leopold and Loeb, told them that he had actually been repairing their car the night of, and then, of course, that's why they rented the other car. They also found uh, the destroyed typewriter from Jackson Park Lagoon in Chicago on June 7th. Eventually, um, Loeb confessed. He was the first one to break. He asserted that Leopold had planned everything, and that had killed Franks in the back, and that he had killed Franks in the back car while Loeb drove. So Loeb, even though we know Loeb is the one that actually killed him, he was reversing it, saying that Leopold did. Um, Leopold said the exact opposite. So they turned on each other rather quickly, um, and after the uh, both confessions, they were announced by the state's attorney on May 31st and were officially charged with kidnapping and murder. Uh, it was asserted that they went after the thrill-seeking nature to, in order to prove they were Superman and pull off the world's perfect crime. The Loeb family immediately hired 
world-renowned attorney, Clarence Darrow. If you're not familiar with Clarence Darrow, he was a he was like, you know, a, a Rob Kardashian or any of the attorneys that sat on the O.G. Simpson case. He was that level of fame uh, during the 1920s. Uh, this would become his first big case. This was considered a trial of the century because of the uh, attention it got. It, it's almost like, you know, the Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell trial of its time period. Uh, a year later, he would... Uh, defend a teacher accused of teaching evolution in Tennessee in the famous Scopes Monkey Trial. He would lose that case, but uh, would eventually appeal it to the point that the Supreme Court would just dismiss the whole thing as they didn't just want to waste any more time with it. And in that, he would face the famous attorney Williams and philosopher Williams Jennings Bryan. So, yeah, he was famous. And according to court records, he was paid $70,000 by the Loeb family. That's equivalent to just over a million dollars in 2022. So he got paid a lot to defend these boys. Um, he basically uh, went at it from a very unique way. He urged them to plead guilty because he told them that he could attempt to defend them uh, with the insanity plea, not guilty by reason of insanity, but he had no doubt that any jury is going to find them guilty and sentence them to death. So he urged them to plead guilty, and he fought it at the sentencing portion of the trial uh, to get them life imprisonment and therefore save their lives. Uh, <clears throat> the trial went on for several months, and in the concluding parts of the sentencing trial, Darrow delivered a 12-hour-long summation. I will not be reading that for you today, but you can definitely look it up. 12 hours. This was like the world's greatest um, filibuster where he literally put forth an insanity defense, even though they had already pled guilty, talking about sexual abuse and other things as well as how often people die in the world and how it's not such a, a, a tragedy and how everyone's a victim. Uh, it's, it was masterful. Daryl was known for winning things on the basis of emotion. So, there you go. Uh, but basically, um, they were sentenced to uh, life imprisonment and an additional 99 years for the kidnap. They were both imprisoned at Joliet Prison. However, within three years, they were both serving out the remains of their sentence at the Statesville Penitentiary. Uh, Loeb would die on January 28, 1936, attacked by an inmate by the name of James Day, who attacked him in the uh, shower room with a straight razor. Uh, he died the day after. Uh, Day claimed that Loeb had sexually assaulted him. Uh, however, Leopold would go on, as I said, to continue to contribute to birdwatching magazines the entire time he was in prison and was eventually paroled after his autobiography life plus 99 years was published in 1958 uh, he lived out the rest of his days in obscurity and eventually would die in puerto rico at the age of 66 in 1971 now during the time he was in puerto rico he did try to kind of keep himself to be kind of an influencer or a celebrity how you want to cause that by setting up a foundation and Profiting him off his book, it didn't work. He he made enough to support himself, but he was never the celebrity that he thought he was destined to be. And that is the very strange case of Leopold and Loeb. I will be back soon with another uh, look at this case through the eyes of Alfred Hitchcock in his nineteen uh, <clears throat> nineteen forty eight movie rope. And with that being said, I'll be back soon. Until then, keto and cry.